Yeah, hello everybody. Today, topic is about Ribera del Duero, one of the Spanish uh, designation of origins, a quite interesting one. You will see in a minute. So Ribera del Duero, you can see it on the map. Uh, yeah, it's it's quite small, about twenty five thousand hectare uh, country, uh, or better to say, region within the uh, Spain. And if you have a look on the Spanish map, there's there are all the uh, wine regions uh, marked with different colors, and the, one of the big ones is Castile de Leon. Yeah? And within this one, we find Ribera del Duero as a designation of origin. So it's in the upper uh, western northern part of Spain, uh, north of Madrid, about one and a half hours of, of drive. Uh, this big region, Castile de Leon, is divided in nine sub regions. You can see it on the left hand lower side of this slide here. The sub regions uh, which are really known beside the Ribera del Duero is for sure Toro for the red wine. Um, then we've got Pierzo with, with uh, Mencia as a, as a red wine as well. And Rueda for a white wine with the variety Vadeo. But this is not topic for the day, it's just Ribera del Duero. So let's see. Uh, Ripera del Duero, uh, it's the most eastern in this northwestern part of Spanish uh, regions. And Ripera del Duero, as such, is split up in four bigger sub areas. The biggest being Burgos, Valladolid, Soria, Segovia. Those are the four areas we are talking about. As said before, it's about 90 minutes drive to the north from Madrid. The region is about 115 kilometers long and 35 kilometer wide. We're talking about roughly 8,000 wine growers in the region and 25,000 hectares. The, those 300 wineries don't mix it up with the wine growers. So the 8,000 wine growers, they are grape producers and they are delivering the grapes to the wineries producing the wine. So this is the difference between wine growers and wineries. Those 300 wineries in this region are located uh, in yeah, throughout the whole region, I could say, and 64, the majority is in Bur Burgos. Um, a lot of uh, wine growers, they used to produce a lot of grapes. So they sold the grapes to co-ops and they were mainly producing bulk wine. As Spanish, still today, is one of the leading countries uh, in bulk wine export. Uh, I have a table laid on where you can see this. Uh, yeah, this trend, so to say, but uh, it has changed, especially for Ribera del Duero in the past. And nowadays, the bottle export of Ribera del Duero is much bigger than the bulk wine export. And the Ribera del Duero became the O, so designation of origin, back in 1982. There were two famous producers, like Vega Sicilia, you've heard about for sure, and Alejandro Fernandez. They changed the picture because they were saying, let's do our own wine. Let's switch from the bulk wine production into the bottled wine production and show what this region can do in terms of quality for our wines, especially the red wines. Um, the good thing on the de Duero is almost the entire production is sold every year. So there is no big stress nowadays. Of course, during Corona, uh, there was a stress as well, but generally you can say they almost sell everything uh, what they are producing. And why is this the case? Because Ribera del Duero really takes the international attention on their very fruit, old uh, and dark style of red wines with a lot of potential for aging. One of the reasons for this is that the highest importance for wine growing is given to the vineyards, the viticultural practices, and they want to transport the terra of the individual vineyards uh, into the bottle. This is what they are looking for. Of course, the Spanish wine law is behind all Spanish wines, so it, it's supporting the Ribera del Duero wines as well. However, in this law, and you will say it later on, we've got the Crianza, we've got the Reserva, the Gran Reserva. Uh, they are defining the aging time in barrels and bottles uh, in, the, in the vineyard. And a lot of modern uh, uh, winemakers, they just stick to the basic, basic level, which is the Concecha back label, meaning 
it's just the vintage on the label. No Crianza, no Reserva, no Crown Reserva, because there they can play uh, with the time in the, in the, in the uh, winery, how they produce the wine and to make the style they want to make, not tied up with those Crianza, Reserva and Crown Reserva uh, laws. Some producers even, they classify the wines to the altitude in the vineyards which is really important here in Ribera del Duero because we're talking about higher level vineyards. It's not a flat country. No, not at all. And just think about Madrid. Madrid has snow every year because it's on a, on a hill of can go up to 1000 meters even. In this region, we will see it in a minute. So the key facts again, about 25,000 hectares, the latitude about 41 degrees north, 42 degrees north, the altitude, range between 700 and 1,100 1, meters above the sea level, the Mediterranean sea level, of course. <clears throat> the average uh, temperature during the growing season is about 20 degrees, so this is much the need, much more than needed. Uh, rain rate 400 to 500 millimeter, and we will see irrigation is permitted, is allowed. You can do irrigation if you want to. A big, big swing in terms of temperature from minus 20 degrees up to 40, 42 degrees Celsius, which does have an effect on the wines, of course, and the, how they taste. The problem, spring frosts. And spring frosts, they can last even until June in this region. So this is quite, yeah, quite a challenge. The production just below 1 million hectoliter. So it's a smaller uh, part of the Spanish production. Anyhow, in terms of the O, so designation of origin, it's a really important part of the Spanish uh, wine production. The main grape varieties, Tinta del Pei, so that's the local name for Templanillo, then Cabernet, Sauvignon, Merlot, and so on. Uh, this region was one of the first regions allowing international grape varieties into the designation of origin uh, classification. Uh, and this was the reason a lot of people say why those wines from Spain were internationally really, really uh, important because the touch of Cabernet was a kind of taste that people were used to abroad and therefore they liked the wines. Of course, it gave more structure, it gave more fruitier wine, younger wines to the market. And this is kind of the secrets of Rebel del Vero. Another thing uh, what we need to mention is the permitted yield is about 7,000 kilograms per hectare. Just compared to Austria, it's 10,000 kilograms per hectare. So we are already below, uh, far below this one uh, compared to Austria. So the quality should be even higher. 80% of the harvest is done by hand. And another important fact is they've got old wines. So 9% of uh, the wines are older than 80 years. Here again, you can see the distribution of the vineyard area in the different subregions. The Burgos area is by far the biggest one. So it's the import most important one. Tempranillo uh, is here the, the variety. Looking on the uh, history, how the vineyard size has developed, you see it's a steady growth up to now, up to the 25,000 hectares. On the other side, the wine growers, so those guys producing the grapes and delivering to the, the wineries, uh, has been going down. I think this is a normal trend all over the world that uh, we get less wineries with a bigger uh, acres or bigger hectares per winery size uh, on the global scale. This is just a normal uh, thing what is going on. So let's have a look on climate, grape growing and some soil types. The climate. It's for sure a continental climate with Mediterranean influence. The winters can be really, really long. As said to you, the, the, the frost can come up to the June time frame even. A low to moderate rainfall. This is mostly in winter and springtime. So there might be a drought throughout the summer time and the autumn time. The denural swing, so the swing on a daily basis between the coldest temperature of the day and the warmest temperature in the day can be up to 30 degrees. And this gives you more suple tannins, this gives you more fruit structure and more complexity on the wine. And this is one of the key features of Ribera del Duero. Frost, I mentioned already, can be a major issue. And the growing season has 192 frost days, uh, 200 being the norm. So 
192 frost-free days, days without frost. Uh, this is, I would say, marginal. Yeah? So we are just on the edge. But we know for a really good wine, for a really good quality, we need a climate which is on the edge. Yeah? A little bit too much, a little bit too less. All this makes a good quality wine. From a viticulture point of view, the tradition in Spain, overall in Spain, has been bush trained wines, so Goblet trained wines. Uh, there's still a lot of these Goblet trains or bush trained wines out there. The modern vineyards, they use trellis systems, so the wiring system with uh, vertical shoot positioning. The average is about 4,000 wines per hectare. And as mentioned before, Ribera del Duero got very, very old wines. Just sum up the figures here. Uh, so it's about 11, yeah, 11,000 hectares out of those 25,000 hectares, which are older than 50 years. We even got about 500 hectares over 100 years. And those wines are uncrafted. So they were here before Phylloxera. Phylloxera was in Spain as well, end of the 19th century. Um, the Verizon to harvest date. So Verizon is the, the name for uh, the timing when the skins of the red grapes turn in color from green to red uh, is between 50 and 60 days, normal 40 days. Again, the cool climate there. We need much longer. So harvest October time frame, sometimes November time frame, no uh, issue at all. And as I said before, 80% is hand harvesting here. About organic, um, I didn't get an organic slide for the Repair del Duero subregion as a standalone slide, but I can show you the Spanish figure. Spanish, in terms of area, is the leading country for organic uh, wine production. And this is reflected in Repair del Duero as well. Because of the dryness in summer, they can go for organic uh, winemaking, and the number is increasing, I would almost say, on a daily basis. Uh, so the portion in combination to the share uh, of Spain on organic vineyards is the same in Ribera del Duero than in all the other countries. The soil type, yeah, we have a mixture, different layers of sand, silt and clay. So the clay soils, which are more in the eastern part of the Ribera del Duero, they provide uh, with a good structure and a good character. And of course, we've got wool water retention capacity there. The limestone soils, which are active cut or active limestone, uh, they are quite dry. They provide the elegance and the complexity to the wines. And then we've got the stony soils. Of course, they do have a very good drainage. So the water is going through. They give maturity and sweetness in terms of ripeness, not in terms of uh, residual sugar of the wines. This is something completely different. So the more we go from the east to the west, uh, I would say we start with the structured wine and then we go with the more powerful wines to the western part. And irrigation is permitted. So you can do uh, fermentation if you want. About the history, uh, good old Europe, a long, long, long history. So the Phoenicians were here about 1000 before Christ. They did some wine growing already. I don't want to uh, name all the bullet points here. I just want to highlight the most important ones, which is the 15th century. The Ordenanza de Castilla, uh, Castilla Bailos, came in force. And this was the first law who regulated the production, the quality, and the export of uh, Castilian wines. Yeah? It was the first step for the designation of origin, and it was promoting quality which was really, really key at that time. And on 21st of July, 1982, Ribera del Duero became uh, the Eustatus. Uh, yeah, since then, a lot of investment happened in this region. Modern winemaking techniques were used. And uh, yeah, the quality was really rocket science, going up, going up, going up all the time. The grape varieties in Ribera del Duero, Tinta del Bay. Tempranillo, the local name for Tempranillo in Ribera del Duero, it's about 95% of all the plantings is Tempranillo. So we can say it's a Tempranillo country. The second one, Cabernet Sauvignon. 
And if you just compare these figures, so Tempranillo is one, roughly 100 times more than Cabernet Sauvignon. And then the rest splits up. Um, Arbillo Mayo is a white wine grape variety. It's not the only one, but it's the most important white wine grape variety in the Ribera del Duero region. Uh, it's producing, yeah, quite good wines as well in two different styles, but this we look on later on. Tempranillo, as said, 95% of all the plantings are with this grape. Tinto del Pei or Tinto Fino are the local names. Tempranillo is a quite fixed skinned variety, buds and ripens early. However, it needs time for aging. So the harvest for this one might be earliest, depending on the wine style, of course, in the end of September, October, November timeframe. Yeah? And Tempranillo is uh, derived from the word uh, for early in the Spanish uh, language. So it's the early uh, flavoring uh, uh, variety here. Uh, it develops a good fall body at firm tannins, a medium to high acidity. Of course, depending on the altitude. The higher the altitude is, the more firm, the more high the acidity is going to be. Typically flavors, blackberry, plums, red berries, and then, of course, if you do oak aging, French oak, or even American oak, but mostly it's French oak, uh, vanilla spice, leather, and tobacco in there. And the rest, uh, you know Cabernet Sauvignon, you know Merlot, you know Malbec. So Cabernet Sauvignon, a really, really late ripening variety, firm tannins, high acidity, gives structure to the wine. The mellow provides a power to the wine because of soft tannins and moderate acidity, but can be high in alcohol and the Malbec medium body, a very bright acidity and black fruit flavors and color, of course, comes with Malbec. Malbec always has got this pink touch in there, which adds to the color, early budding as well. Garnacha Tinta, the traditional old Spanish uh, variety, which was taken over by Tempranillo on a Spanish scale. Um, yeah, a couple of decades back, uh, is grown there as well. Typically are the strawberry notes and of course, uh, moderate tannins and moderate acidity, but powerful wines, high alcohol. And Albilio Mayor, the white grape variety, uh, is a variety who can really, if done in a more bold style, a full-bodied wine with low to medium acidity, hints of golden color, tropical fruit aromas, like pineapples, uh, then pierced stone, uh, st stone fruit aromas. And what's not known clearly is that even up to 5% of Garnacha Tinta and Arbio also the white grape variety, uh, is allowed in red Ribera del Duero wines as a part of co-fermentation, not mixing the wines because this is not allowed in the European Union, but a co-fermentation. It provides freshness to the wine and a uh, more complex flavor. Then we are already at the wine style and the wine making. So the wine style, it's mainly the law, the wine law. Crianza, Reserva and Crown Reserva. The Crianza, this is the, let's say, almost daily wine for consumption. Medium color, medium intensity, fresh, fruity, uh, red fruit in there, medium body, uh, medium to long finish. Reserva and Crown Reserva, they stay much longer in the winery. They have to stay much longer in oak bills. So the oak aging, of course, uh, will decrease the intensity of color, yeah, but increase the complexity of flavors. And this is what Reserva and Crown Reserva is all about. The wine can be even a little bit cloudy. No, no problem. Yeah? Uh, it turns from the purple color to the more purple red color uh, and maybe there are some garnet, garnet rims there, can be as well. A full-bodied wine with a long finish and, of course, potential for the cellar. Rosé, it's an important topic globally right now, but especially in Ribera del Duero as well. Although majority is still red wine, the rosés, and this is something specific, first of all, they have to be from a minimum of 50% of authorized red grape varieties. 
and they need to have 36 months, so three years of total aging, having 12 months spent in a barrel. Yeah? So it's, we're not talking about the fresh and fruity, easygoing rosé, which everybody loves out there. No, we're talking about aged rosés. And there are even rosés, not only from Ribera del Duero, but from Rioja as well. Rioja, Gran Reserva, Ribera del Duero, Gran Reserva, Rosé. They are even not pink anymore in the color. So this is something really, really interesting. So if you get the chance, buy one of these 2010, 2005, 2004 uh, vintages, Rosados, uh, from, from Spain and taste it. It's something really, really nice. Um, in the white wine, when we come to the white wine, as said, at least 75% has to be a Bio Mayor variety. Mainly two styles. The one is the fresh and fruity done in stainless steel without any oak aging. And the second one, which is much more common, or used to be much more common, is the fermentation and or aging in oak barrels. We talk about a full-bodied wine still being fresh, with a moderate or medium acidity there and a lot of tropical fruits. About the vinification, the people say the wine is done in the vineyard and we are just supporting what the vineyard is delivering. So the people try to get the most out of it, what was coming from the vineyard. Therefore, the trend is for longer skin contact. In the skins of the grapes, there is the origin represented. Yeah? A shorter period in barrels, because the barrels, they give, of course, a certain touch of flavor, and they give this oxygen uh, to the wine, which makes it smoother, more rounder, and the fruit a little bit more uh, going down. So therefore, they shorten the time just to transport what's coming from the vineyard as well as from the variety in there. Quite modern equipment is forced by the regulatory. So they need stainless steel, they need hygiene on the highest standard. And of course, they need temperature control, not only during fermentation, but throughout the whole wine making process. What are specific wine terms? Uh, I uh, summed up all of them. I just name a couple of them. For example, if a red wine is labeled under the DO of Ribera del Duero, at least 75% has to be Tempranillo. The blend can be Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot or Malbec to a maximum of 25%. On the Rosado side, at least 50% needs to come from an authorized red wine in there. And on the white wine, 75% has to be a bio mayor in this wine. The title of Crianza, Reserva, Gran Reserva tells you how long this wine has been aging in oak and in the bottle. So we have talked about Crianza, minimum age of 24 months in total, Reserva, 36 months, Gran Reserva, 60 months. So a Gran Reserva five years in the winery and at least 48 months uh, of aging in the in the bell so five years and this is not just for the red you know, this applies to the, the white with a little bit of adoption but especially to the rosado to the rosé wines as well and the very first category you see on this slide is this cosecha which we have mentioned in the very very beginning that a lot of wineries are bottling their wine under this label because they don't need to stick on these aging requirements for the other uh, for the other ones like Crianza, Reserva and Grand Reserva. So they are free, they can make the wine whatever they would like to make, which is targeted to a specific market, to a specific customer, uh, for example, and they label it Cosecha. This is how it's done. And if you talk about the distribution of these different styles, so the majority, by far the majority, more than two thirds, is generico. So it's the cosecha wine, which is done. Followed by the crianza, taking another 20, 25%, and the rest splits up. So the most important style is for sure the generico and the crianza, which is out there in the market. So important things to know, and this is the, the slide I referred to in the very beginning about the exports of the Spanish market. Um, Globally, or, the, or overall, the Spanish wine is a bulk wine export market. The biggest uh, portion 
uh, in terms of volume, of course, is going via the bulk wine segment into the export. Of course, not in value because it's quite sold on a quite, quite low price. The second is the bottled wine. Yeah? And this is uh, very, very interesting for Ribera del Duero because the share or the shift from the bulk wine to the bottled wine is visible in the export as well. Yeah? It's still important to have bulk wine exported from Ribera del Duero, but the bottled wine takes the lead in this subregion compared to the rest of Spain. Why? Because there's one very, very big region in Spain, La Mancha, in the middle of, of Spain. Yeah? They are responsible for 70-75% of the bulk wine export. So you can see uh, the importance of these smaller regions exporting bottled wine, showing the high quality Spain is able to deliver. Another uh, topic for Ribera del Duero is the tourism. Uh, just Google, there are a lot of tourism sites existing for Ribera del Duero, and this is one picture from the Ribera del Duero tour tourism uh, homepage, uh, where you are invited to visit Ribera with different, uh, yeah, um, really attractions they can give you. They have the so-called Ribera del Duero wine route. And on this wine route, there are 62 wineries. You, uh, even more coming to join. So you can really say, I want to have a, a route through these three, four or five wineries on a day and pass by and taste the wines and have a, a good uh, meal even included in there. Yeah, uh, They do a lot of uh, yeah, promotional things together with those guys. They are audited, so not every winery can be part of this Ribera del Duero wine route. No, they are audited. And if they are according to the standards, then they are part of the Ribera del Duero wine route. Yeah? And why they do it? A study from the ACE wine found out that the enotourists, so this is the word for the enological tourists, so the wine tourists, yeah, or tourists interested in wine, spends on average um, about 162 euros per day. And this is quite a lot of money. And of course, it helps the, the region. The another thing is what they're doing, wine and art or art and wine. A lot of museums, they do have um, showings with paintings, with uh, artists yeah, together with wine. So the wine is the integral part of the region. And this is transported in here as well. Leading producers, yeah, they are, I just want to name two. Of course, there are much more to be named. I just took the Vega Sicilia and the Pesquera. The Pesquera, you see the bottle in the middle, and Vega Sicilia on the left hand, on the right hand side of this slide. Uh, their famous wine is called Unico. You see it on the left hand side. It's a Tempranillo Cabernet Merlot blend. And there's a special Unico, Unico Reserva, uh, which takes the three best vintages in the last decade and put it together. So it's a blend. So it's a Unico Reserva is a non-vintage wine. Quite interesting, but it's one of these 100 points wine, yeah, uh, with Robert Parker uh, being in love in this full-bodied, dark red, uh, even black wines with a lot of fruit aroma, high amount of French oak in there. So really powerful, powerful wines. Example for labels. Yeah, I just want to show you these uh, four different styles of wine. Crianza, Reserva, Gran Reserva, Cosecha. Uh, these labels, they are different in color. All of them, they stick on the back label, yeah? all of them do have a, a numbering system just to follow up how many bottles are produced and to secure the quality in the bottle. Uh, this is quite important. So you will see this label on each wine of Ribera del Duero, classifying which category it belongs to and which quality level it's going to be. So easy going for you if you know the categories and you know what to buy. So think about what you like to drink, look on this label and go for it. That's it. So this is uh, what I was to uh, say about the Ribera del Duero, a really, really interesting region, a red wine region, Tempranillo being the number one, uh, a cool climate region compared to other regions in Spain, uh, delivering full bodied a red wine with a lot of fruit and French oak. And don't forget, this has been one of the first regions having international varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot allowed in the regulations to be put into the blend. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.